I've been Newton Conover now for 11 years. I've been superintendent since my fifth year superintendent. Um, uh, I'm a lifelong educator, but education obviously is um, a big part of my life, having uh, family members and, and so forth uh, as educators. But I want to give you a little quick background on why this is so, I'm so passionate about pre-K in particular. Uh, my dad was an eighth grade dropout, and my mother, um, they both were farm families, big, big families. And they got married when uh, my mom was still in high school. She was 16. Uh, so I was born to young parents. And my parents were very poor and didn't know much about how to raise a child. Uh, I was lucky that a uh, program called Head Start uh, I got involved with. And I think it's a precursor to some of what's going on today, pre-K. That three-year-old and four-year-old um, exposed me to literature, math, things that I didn't get in my household. Uh, I now have a doctorate degree. Uh, who would have ever thought that? And I think that starting off on the right foot put me on the right path because, uh, as we know, the students that come from households where they're exposed to literature and exposed to uh, numeracy and exposed to uh, problem solving and, 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 and enrichment, they're going to be more successful. They start out with a base knowledge that a lot of students who aren't exposed to that uh, spend many years trying to recoup. And, and the gap is quite large, actually, um, when you have students come in. You have students come in reading in kindergarten, and you have some students that don't know what the front of a book looks like. Um, so it's, a, it's quite a discrepancy. But we have a way to impact that through pre-K. So um, Kim, you, uh, you, as we now know, Kim came from New York. So that's hilarious. How I know. <laughs> and I've been uh, director of the Partnership for Children for almost 20 years, um, 19 and change, and. Um, feel really passionately about early childhood in terms of what well, I've raised both my children now um, and realize the impact of that and knowing the impact that child care, high quality child care had on my kids mm -hmm. and I credit their teachers in child care for raising them where I'm working mm -hmm. and a lot of families are in that circumstance where they're working and they need someone during the day to, to teach their kids um, and so we are in a community that's very high percentage of working moms. Um, so our child care community and access to child care is really critical um, in Catawba County in North Carolina. Um, and the gaps that we're seeing uh, oftentimes are related directly to those who had no pre-K experience. Right. Um, and so that's what we're trying to mitigate. Trying to figure out what the gaps are. Our, our agency, the Partnership for Children, is focused on making sure that every child in Catawba County starts school healthy and prepared for success. And all that entails. Um, so, and a lot of that has to do with making sure that they do have a high quality environment um, to learn those soft skills <coughs> like socialization and how to share and how to work, work as teams um, and then some of those pre-academic skills that obviously are going to make a huge impact when they get to school and, and literacy and that kind of thing. So um, it's all kind of building blocks that we're working towards here and the key is finding those that don't have access to the building blocks right. um, and making sure that we can set them up. Uh, so that's kind of the, the crux of this, which here's a nice little... Yes, and, and so much of what we've talked about, the, we, we, there's tons of research and we won't go deeply into it, but uh, the, the thing that education does, it, you can change a legacy. It's not just changing that individual, it changes my pre-school experience and my, my schooling experience, changed my children's lives, not just my life. Uh, so we know early education is important. What we've seen uh, throughout all research is that when students have a quality early education, that they start school ready to learn. The socialization piece, is, as was mentioned, the, um, the ability to work with others, the, the ability to problem solve and, and to uh, work with their hands even. There's a lot of tactile learning at these ages, uh, helping children to problem solve through issues. It has a direct impact on, there's a lot of things on the brain, uh, the synapses across the brain, and they have to be developed. And a lot of it has to do with the, the, the central cortex, the movement across the center lines. Students can't read until they can do some of these things first. It, it, there's tons and tons of research with it. When a student comes to us and doesn't have this, it takes many years to build that up, and, and or you're still trying not to hold back those that are already to that point. But reading by third grade, there's been a lot of research about the fact that reading by third grade is usually that tipping point of the gap being closed. If it's not closed by third grade, it typically won't get closed. The students that are ahead will continue to grow at a faster rate than those who are behind. So it really compounds over the years from that point. So third grade is really that defining moment. We know if they're reading, reading well by third grade, that's why there's such an emphasis on reading the third grade, that they're typically going to be better prepared for graduation and for whether it's the workforce, whether it's for the military, uh, whatever it is to go uh, contribute to our society. And we know we have a workforce gap here in this county. 
So we want to make sure our graduates are better prepared and are, uh, are fluid enough in their learning to, to adapt to whatever's out there. We don't know what they're going to be facing when they get out of uh, high school and college. So we know that pre-K is the very starting point that kind of puts them in the right direction. Some of the goals that um, we have, obviously, we want to invest in research-based methods for uh, improving academic attainment, focus on not uh, just casting a wide net. We want to really focus on students from at-risk populations, much like I came from, uh, especially with socioeconomic disparity. Students who either their parents are working and there's no one home to work with them on uh, some of this pre-K development, uh, or they are parents are at home but don't understand themselves how to help their child. Um, we want to utilize current infrastructures. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we want to work uh, together, uh, Newton Conover in particular, we want to work with the partnership to, to expand the space we have. I will tell you that um, we house pre-K in, in public ed, but it's not funded by public education. Public education is K-12 only. So anything we do with pre-K has to come out of other funds. You can generate those funds through fee pay, through the, the fees you get, but the fees are roughly $485 per student. With the ratio uh, uh, that is allowed, uh, one teacher and one assistant for 18 students max, the 485 does not even cover salaries, much less all the other residual costs to go along with it. So when a school district takes on a pre-K classroom, they're taking on when there's 20 to 25 thousand dollars of money outside of what will come from the fee fee payers that we'll have to come up with. So you start adding four, five, six classrooms. It gets, but it, it helps our community. It is definitely the worthy investment. But you have to find those funds because they don't come from the state. We don't generate funds as a uh, education. We don't have fundraisers well, at the district level. We don't have things. We can't sell a product to make more money. It's really our, our funds dictate what services we offer. So with some, <coughs> with some resources, we feel like we can expand uh, pre-K programs in our school district. Again, we're targeting uh, countywide. We're not just targeting students and our children in the boundaries of Newton Hunter City Schools. We're hoping to reach out whether the students go to private school down the line, whether they go to a charter school, whether they're homeschooled, or they go to any of the three school districts in our county. We want to reach any student that may need those services that don't currently have access to it. So we're looking at at-risk populations, low-income, minority populations, those with any special needs across the entire county. Um, and in, in particular, those who don't have pre-K experiences before. We're trying to offer the services that they may not otherwise have access to. <coughs> so we talked about this a little bit, and I included one page in your packet that's just an interesting piece, and the, the big, there's tons of research about this now, and brain development is so fascinating when it comes to early childhood, but David mentioned the synapses in the brain, but the, the truth is 90% of a child's brain is developed in the first five years of life. Is the only organ not fully developed when at birth. And so we can't start worrying about kindergarten readiness when they start kindergarten. We've got that 2,000 days right there that really the clock starts ticking. And we need to make sure that they get everything they need in those 2,000 days so that their brains are developed to the point that they're going to be on par with their peers when they start kindergarten. This was just a really good piece, I thought. This first 2,000 days work at the state level. Um, and we're really blessed in North Carolina to have an awesome state infrastructure for this work. Um, but all of the impacts of early childhood on our community, not the least of which is the economy, right? Um, in terms of the one thing, allowing families to work um, and having a safe place for the children to go during the day. But then ultimately, when those children are well prepared, then they, then they can contribute to society 18, 20, 25, 30 years later. Um, so it, it is investment in, in the future, and it's not an instant gratification work. Um, we are doing this for the long haul. This is an important long-term projection for us. Um, and that's just an overview of how goes all those categories on that, that, show, that sheet. Um, North Carolina Pre-Kindergarten Program started here in Catawba County in 2001. We were actually one of the pilot counties in the state. Um, the Catawba County Partnership for Children is the administer for, administer for the NC Pre-K Program. So we're the ones that we get the funding from the state and then we, we're kind of a flow through. We make sure the program is running well and following the rules and we pass the funding on to those who are providing that direct service. Um, the mission is to make sure that children, especially at-risk children, typically that is an economic distinction, um, are, have access to pre-K, high quality pre-K. It is funded through the Division of Child Development at the state level. Um, it's specifically for four-year-olds, so it's for the one year prior to kindergarten, and those kids that otherwise would show up to kindergarten without any pre-K experience at all. Um, it is contract, contracted through us. 
Um, but again, we're basically a pass-through, and we, we really make sure we monitor the programs to make sure that they're following all the uh, all the goals. How many, uh, just so a real quick question, I mean, how many slots do you already have? Um, the next slide. Huh. <laughs> that was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> Um, we, currently have, yeah. <laughs> we currently have 348 uh, pre-K slots in Catawba County, um, and they are distributed among several different locations. So we have some in public elementary schools, and we also have some in private child care centers. The product is a high-quality preschool environment. The location is kind of uh, incidental um, in terms of if we can house these programs wherever someone will host a classroom that's going to meet these high-quality standards. Um, one of the high quality standards has to do with um, teacher education, for example, which you would not find in a typical, typical child care setting, where they wouldn't have to have a birth or kindergarten degree to teach in a child care setting. They also make minimum wage in a child care setting, often. Um, in an NC pre-K classroom, they feel strongly that a, that a teacher must be prepared with a birth or kindergarten degree. The teacher assistant has to have an associate's in early education or better. Um, and also, they must be paid comparable to the state teacher pay salary schedule which is a fantastic model for how it should work in early childhood. Um, these teachers do just as much work as an elementary school teacher and should be uh, rewarded as such. So the pre-K program is really important in terms of rewarding teachers that have the education and do the service. And so because it's... Oh, now it's sort of, of those 348, yep. if you have openings or if there's a waiting list or... We're, well, we have a waiting list. Now, um, this has been a tricky conversation. David and I were talking about this. Every year, it seems like the children uh, change where they are. It's only a one-year program, so we can only plan as far as that one school year. Um, we are currently full in all of our NC pre-K classrooms, except for Friday, we had a mother at North Newton who has twins, and then a third child who was within that one year, like Irish twins and then twins, and they're moving to Virginia. I was like, dang it, we have three openings. We're <laughs> so close. But, um, okay. but typically, we're full. Yeah. Um, we are a little leery of a lot of marketing because we stay full, and I hate to have people sign right. up for a program where they're going to be sitting That's why we haven't expanded. Yeah, yeah. I hear that. Yeah. Yeah. So the kids are out there. In fact, right now we're doing a study of all of the kindergarten teachers across all three districts. We are asking those families, did you go to pre-K, yes or no, if not, why? Um, and, and kind of just to get a sense of what the programming is that we need and where the gaps are in services. Yeah. So makes sense. Yeah. So this is word of mouth. People find out about this from typically word of mouth? social services, public health, pediatricians' offices, school systems are a huge referral source. So it's a targeted group, really. It's not. Mm -hmm. We're not casting based, based on mm -hmm. income. Yes, for the most part. For the most part. Mm -hmm. Or or yeah. learning disability. Sometimes yeah. we'll have a student come to us, our child come mm -hmm. to us that has development delays and the doctor will refer them to pre-k because of significant delays within there whether it be verbal or any type. Do you get extra extra money from um, the feds for that one? No, we don't get any for money. Early, early intervention? No, and those are smaller. How many are having those classes? Six or eight? In your yeah. easy classes? So it's, it's way more expensive for us but the funds, yeah. I think they still draw them to 485. You know that better now. The NC pre-k kids? Yeah. yeah, they're still 45. It's so the standard rate. It might, it might, you might have, so we have a class right now that has six, I believe, in it. Five or six at kind of school. Those uh, are NC pre-k kids. Yeah. Sure kids so yeah. the, the funds aren't any different with those students uh, if they're NC pre-k. Now we have, she mentioned we have NC pre-k kids. You can also have, if you have slots, you can have fee payers, people who come to you and say, I want my kid in this daycare, but only if we have slots available. But typically, we fill those up with students with learning disabilities, NC pre K students uh, in those times. The, uh, the other thing to this is just um, part of the conundrum that a lot of people face is it's not just providing space. You have to, there's a, lots of requirements with the teacher education, uh, with the infrastructure of the class, the access to a bathroom, to water, um, play space, uh, not just play space, it has to have a certain what's the depth of the mall so like it has to be specific type of mall to a specific depth they'll come out and measure it shade areas so it's very very uh, regulated and so all these fit that bill yes. so all these have fit yeah. that bill yeah. and right. there's probably the reason more places aren't offering it up is they <laughs> cost to do a playground to do a the learning space to you know, provide all that mm -hmm. um, and pay the teacher too. And pay the teacher when when the teachers cost more than the income coming in. You have to just commit to being to wanting a pre k student. And keep in mind, these students that come to us, twenty percent of them may come to Newton College as students. They may go all over the county. So it's not like you're committing students to necessarily be in your own school district. So um, 
That was like 15 minutes, but we keep on going. <laughs> we can go super fast now. Okay, so that's what we mean by blended classrooms. We'll have some NC pre-K blended with exceptional children, blended with fee payers, so we have kind of a typical um, picture of a, like a kindergarten classroom would look. All right, and this is just a little bit about the quality part. So yeah, high, high quality in terms of the state licensure system. Um, it's a school day, school calendar. It's free for families. There's a state approved curriculum, so we don't make choices about that. I mean, there are curricula we can choose between, but we have to choose one of those. And again, like David said, um, maximum class size of 18 students. Oh, teachers. Oh, and then we were in about the, yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, and I did include this in your packet, just so you could kind of see the study that we did. And this is back in 2012-13. Um, we wanted to compare kids that went to NC Pre-K and compare them to children that had no Pre-K experience. So, so it would have been our goal kids to get into an NC Pre-K classroom. And then we disaggregated that data by uh, ethnicity. And so you can see, I mean, there's just, there's no clearer picture of how these children benefit from being in this program. Um, and these are at-risk children. It's not like we took the cream of the crop. And that, I mean, these yes, are kids yeah. who may have not had any experience as otherwise. Yeah. I don't understand why the graph. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, I don't understand. Let's see. So the, the gold or the oh, dial four percent. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I don't understand. Okay. That is pretty impressive. It's, it was amazing. Yeah. yeah, it was one of those studies that I, I was thrilled with the results, and we then took it to the next level and, and looked at EOG data for third grade gateway, um, and and we found that our NC pre K kids were higher than the, the total population, which we would have been pleased had they been on par with the right. population. But single wow. NC pre-K so, or just people who had pre-K experience? NC pre-K. So, mm -hmm. They were yeah. higher. They drilled down. Yeah. Yeah. They drilled down. Because yeah. if we do all pre-K, yeah, kids like my children would be yeah. thrown in there, which yeah. may skew it. We want to make sure how was NC pre-K impacted. So, it's amazing. That's a great, that's yeah. great. Yeah. Which, again, is changing their whole trajectory. Yeah, yeah. The, the biggest statistic that um, I'm not sure which of you shared it with me but it was 75 percent of the children who start kindergarten behind stay behind their entire academic career that just because you have to remember that the students that aren't behind they're not going to wait they're not waiting for you to catch up you have to not only grow but grow at a faster rate than those who have had pre experience mm -hmm. it's next to impossible to, to close that gap if you, especially by third grade but it's hard to get them caught up once they're in school mm -hmm. so, so uh, Really what we're looking at is we know that the cost to, do, to adding pre-K has to come. We have to find funds to be able to add program at, programs in space. And again, much of it has to do with the uh, ex extra cost associated with the classroom teachers and with the uh, classroom space. One of the things that's not on here, and I think it might be on the next slide, you heard the gentleman mention transportation as an issue. They're not on, we don't get funded for transportation. We at Newton Conover, we're willing to pay for transportation to, if we were able to find the classroom, classroom funding, we would pay to bust those students in. I'll find the money somewhere, uh, but we would commit to that. We just know it's this important. Um, but the, the cost, uh, right now we have a space uh, at Conover School. It, it has housed in the past as many as five pre-K classrooms there. Right now there's only one. Uh, but we have, we have the playground space already available. We have the, all the regulations are met. So really just be upfitting with supplies, the, the furniture, and then the teachers. Uh, so it would be a very cost-efficient way because everything else is in place. Um, looking at renovations this year with uh, the cost of signage and some of the upfitting, and then adding, uh, if you were so inclined, adding up to four classrooms over the next three plus years, uh, there are the costs associated with it. Again, the 20000 a year per class, we would then inherit because the two, 2018 for the two new classes, uh, 40 grand the following year if you add another class we have to then pick up that 40 grand because they're still there every year um, but we, we feel like it's a worthy cause um, what, what do you mean we so pick up the 40 grand oh, that, that's for capital improvements no the, the, the only capital is on 2017 the uh, the, the funding is for serving the, the cost of the teachers yeah. for serving there are some capital outfits I and mean, we put some money in there for supplies for the uh, the classroom but the the major cost is the cost of the actually running the classroom, the cost of the, the salaries and the... So basically if you're getting, like what, you said $450 a month per student? 45. 45, okay. So, and 18 students in 10 months. So, talking about like $80,000. And the, I mean, I, I, I get it. I mean, it, it costs $50,000 state retirement and everything for just one, you know, bachelor's degree teacher. That's right. And then you got to have an assistant. All right. 
Um, and that's where the first year, for, uh, really beginning of the year, beginning of the career teachers are probably at that fifty thousand dollar range. So yeah. that's why we, it's an average. You know, some some classrooms aren't as much, but um, the big cost is in people, and and, and the, the equipment is a big piece of it as well. You know, the the furniture is very specific to our regulations, and she could speak more to that than I can. Um, the capital improvements would be part of it, the, the equipment. Utilities. Um, but, utilities. But you don't, so you don't have what like, cots was one thing you mentioned. Do you, mm -hmm. you don't have enough cots for all those classrooms. We don't. So that's part that's of that. That's part of the 20 yeah. per classroom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the 4,000 in 2019 and then the six in 2020 so, is, uh, Kim taught me uh, what consumables mean in the pre K world. <laughs> Yeah. Because even books are consumables when you're talking about four-year-olds. Right. So that would be to make a, a minor reinvestment in the classrooms that do exist, mm -hmm. as well as we're adding on to the new ones. How is transportation provided now in the NC Pre-K? Parents drive okay. their kids there, yeah. And typically it goes fairly well with the kids we've got now. We work a lot with families working together and they live in the same trailer park and they might all carpool together mm -hmm. and, and we work those kind of relationships out. Um, but it's, you know, it, it continues to be a challenge for folks that don't have a car. Um, so it's kind of something we're always thinking of and always trying to kind of retrofit the system. But it's not covered, it's not paid for by the state. So we don't have the funding for that at the moment. And these children are there at the regular school hours that the right. elementary school is, right. and so they're fed. That's right. Yeah, right. Yeah, and they, they do free reduced lunch program through the federal government. Yeah, and we also they have access to before and after school care if they choose to have it. Um, <clears throat> we, we offer daycare, uh, pre, preschool, not preschool, it would be yeah. before pre school, pre school. Pre yeah. uh, starting at 6 or 6.15 and all the way till 5, 30, 6 o'clock in the evening. So wow. we know that parents would you know, with schedules they may not have access to get them even if somebody were transporting them so we're trying to take away all the excuses that may be limiting their ability to do this if they're not paying out of pocket transportation is provided a good fit mm -hmm. yeah. logistically if you start a new classroom at conover school and the kids that signed up one lives here one lives in hickory one lives in newton one lives in maine mm -hmm. i mean are you going to run a bus yeah. all so conover school serves the whole county already uh, so okay. we have buses in every part of the county already. Right. So we we would what we would do is we would have to look at the routing, try to find the best way. We talked to the bus garage. What they would do is they would look where those students are and where we have the closest route, and they would only charge us the distance from going off path and coming. Oh, back. okay. So we would pay we would pay that difference in the routes. We cover most of the county, and it fluctuates depending on where the kids that go to Conover live. But we were. Or you can do drop zones. Yeah, and we've done that in the past as well. Some parents, we have we have another shared program, Discovery High School, where parents drop them off at drop homes, yeah. and we pick them up there. So we're willing to work with a parent. Four might be more difficult. It's a little harder. Time. But, but I mean, I'm sure there would have to be some type of, yeah, what's the law on retrofitting the, so the buses? we have to put five-point harnesses yeah. on the buses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's part of the cost as well. And, and are they allowed to, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Transportation, is all ages are on this bus, or just the pre-K? We would, no, not just pre-K. They would be on there with other elementary Age, uh, and then a monitor. Yeah, they'll have a monitor on there as well. Do you have monitors now? On the Conover buses, we do. Yeah. yeah, that's why it would make most sense. It's a critical component of it. I it think is. the transportation yeah, it really is. I agree. Now, <coughs> NC Pre K is different in that it's parent choice in terms of location. Right. So, you know, if they work in Newton and live in Hickory and they'd rather have their kid in a Newton location, then we don't have you know, district lines. Um, but we would basically, when we get all the applications in, we'd find the locations that were closest to each That's family. Right. And okay. so, mm -hmm. theoretically, right. we wouldn't have a lot of main families coming into right. Conover School. Okay. You know, we would try to figure that, that out in South Newton. Um, yeah, we have other options for locations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Your, your waiting list is how long now? I mean, would, I'm yeah. assuming that we, you can accommodate 72. Yeah, I mean, next school year, all that's right. You know, we start over in marketing and all that kind of stuff. So we really work hard in marketing for that. And I mean, right now, we've got 54 on the waiting list. Mm -hmm. um, Without really trying, trying. Without we just trying. Them out. Yeah, and well, they're out of luck too. That's because they'll be five years old next year. Yeah, one year. Yeah. <coughs> now we have some turnover, yeah. and it's moved and whatnot, but likely they're not going to get services this year. That's yeah. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. Oh yeah, and as, as much as we hope that Catala will continue to grow, and there'll be more, more yeah. markets. Yeah, right, so, right. And we really don't know what the market will be since we aren't. They aren't advertising, <coughs> and it's really word of mouth. And that we targeted such a specific audience. I, I don't know that we're reaching everyone, even by word of mouth. So if we were targeting, uh, we, we've done in the past where we've gone out to some of the uh, community centers and the churches. That's our best way to get the word out. Doctors' offices, I believe. Uh, I do believe that we would be able to at least 
grow it not along fast, but mm -hmm. if we don't have space, we don't really have the opportunity to try. Mm -hmm. I think that's it. Either I'm doing this wrong. There we go. So our commitment, hiring the staff, managing the classrooms, any other recruitment, supplemental funding, transportation, those kind of things, the harnesses, the, the mileage and all that. Of the NC pre-K, the state rate, the partnership would be managing the contract and uh, selecting and uh, we had nothing to do with the selection. They let us know these, these families are the ones that want are best fitting here based on their needs. <coughs> do you get that four eighty five a month per child, no matter how many kids or is there a cap? I mean per kid per month. Mm -hmm. so and that's forty eight fifty per kid for a ten month program. And if you added a hundred new kids you get that money? Well yeah we'd be responsible for asking the state for expansion. So we're in a kind of a critical time right now too with the state budget because in the second year of the uh, budget they did approve an NC pre-K expansion. So it's very oh, likely yeah, for us to be able to get those question. slots in the state. <laughs> one child for one month is four eighty five. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, I mean it's in, in a way it's cart for the horse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're planning ahead for an expansion we haven't received yeah. yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Although, you know, at this point, uh, it looks really good. We did get expansion this past year, yeah, yeah. Um, and we expanded at um, in Startown and then at Hickory High, um, and we got what we were asking for. So, and next year's expansion is supposed to be larger than this year's expansion. So, can, can, assume, can, assume, there's not, no, can you speak just a moment to um, the smaller classroom size regulations and how that's also kind of could compromise what you already have? Even. How so? Um, just space. The, or maybe that's not come, not maybe that's not the best way to, to explain it. But your op options for pre-K classrooms. Yeah, the physical. Oh, yeah, the square footage is very specific, and not every classroom would even even if you had empty classrooms, not every space meets the requirements. So you have, and even things like hot water and, and outside, outside exits. Outside exits. And so there's a lot of things that make it impossible to put them in mini school classrooms. Square footage even. Yeah. Square footage. And then the thought, back to the, the expansion, the thought process with being at Conover is that we have such a consolidation of resources already there, the playground equipment, all mm -hmm. everything's there, and it serves the whole county already. So if someone says, I, I live in Maiden, there are no slots there, we, we feel like they, if they could get quality pre-K, they would be willing to come to uh, a quality pre-K program. And that's the biggest, we would have to not only market NC pre-K, but market Conover schools pre-K program as a quality program, having opportunities for parents to visit um, and, and see what's available there. They don't know much about it, to be honest. So I think that's as important as anything. It's a good point. Are you making similar investments in the, I saw these said some NC pre-K schools are in your schools now. Are you making, I guess, some of the same financial sac sacrifices? Oh yeah, those? yeah. yeah. Every year. And that's why year to year we, we've, been, we've offered, um, we have NC Pre-K and we also have uh, uh, Head Start, Head Start uh, which is a different Pre-K program that's funded very differently. And we've had um, a private organization run a Pre-K program out of our uh, facilities in the past as well. And they, they do all the work hiring, uh, we just give them the space for free. We, you know, and all that depends on space and time and money and uh, we've made it a priority. Just, you know, just the funding's not there, it's the biggest problem. Timeline. I, I mean, we can get the same going by 2018, I think. That would be our plan. Yeah. yeah, I think we would be. Uh, if the funding's there, I think we'd start asking for the slots and the money, uh, the uh, slots and the uh, uh, marketing to get the students and then licensure for the students. Yeah. And can you speak just a little bit to um, the when we're not talking about the classroom fees, but this money that we're actually coming from our 2017 budget? We're talking about signage and. Um, if there's a kind of drop off or all in, right. that, that sort of thing. Can you speak to some of those specifics? Yeah, the uh, the school at the Converse, at Converse School, we have some classroom space that's been pre-K in the past, so it would fit the regulations. We don't have some of the equipment that would go along with it, from furniture to the, the cots, all the different things. It's, it's very very expensive stuff. Just nobody, it's not cheap to, to get it, and then. Uh, the sign is important, even um, looking at the um, running sidewalks because of some of this, some of the classroom environment will be having been used for pre-K. If we expand, we'll have to find a way to meet the regulations, um, the exits and the sidewalks, those kind of things. It's cosmetic stuff, but it's the only way we can actually open up as a pre-K classroom if we meet the regulations. And you've also spoken to, to this problem having a separate name. Yes. So. Yeah. A separate entrance. 
There's three entrances to the school right now. Our thought was, um, if you don't know, the Connor School is a severely uh, profound disabled students from all across the county, actually outside of the county as well, ages three to 22. Um, <coughs> so I want to move away from that stigma that anybody might have with it, having you know, its own separate entrance. We, we feel like if we have its own separate entrance and its own name, you're going to the whatever daycare, uh, pre preschool center. We've done this in the past and it was very successful when we were at Thornton Education Center. It was on the campus with high school students across the street from another high school and nobody blinked an eye because it was the Thornton Education Pre-K Center. And they came in a separate entrance. Hmm. They never interacted with the, the high school students. They never even blinked about it. It's really marketing is a big part of it. Sure. Sure. <coughs> David, one last thing. You had also <coughs> spoken to um, ways you might be able to serve the entire family. Can you tell us how that just... Yeah, well, and, and I don't know if I've talked a lot with Kim about this. I think from my own experience as a coming through, I think educating the family and the parents are, is just as important as meeting the needs of the child. Parents need to know because many times they have, it's not just one child, so you want to make sure that you help them improve their own capabilities of coaching their own children and helping their own uh, child before they even get to the preschool age, being the first teacher in the, in the household. So. Uh, the more that we can help create that culture in this county, uh, the better it's going to benefit all students. And that way there isn't as large of a gap when they do come to us, even as a at-risk I would think your imagination library helps with some of that. Yeah, we're, really, we're proud of that program. Yeah, yeah it's gone very Kids long. get books. Mm -hmm. I should thank you, Lee, uh, to so let you. This has been delightful. I mean, I've learned an awful lot. Thank you so yes, thank much you for, for coming. Sure thank you for our time. time. Thank you, Beth. All right, thank you. Appreciate you very much. So it's not going to be the whole.